Hi there, Nikki. Hi there, Nigel. It's uh, good to see you guys again. Hey, hi, Keith. Hey, Nigel. Hi, Nikki and Keith. All right. Good day, everyone. Um, yeah, I can see everyone slowly, slowly coming on to the, to the webinar. And um, yeah, warm greetings from Nikki, Nigel, and I. Uh, as always, it's wonderful to see so many of you joining us yet again for another of our Dream Destination webinars. And today we're off to Thailand, uh, without a doubt, one of my personal favorite countries to explore. The birding really is phenomenal, and there's nowhere else in Asia where you can see as many birds in the same amount of time. Um, most places you can see maybe 300, 400 species in, in three weeks or so um, in Asia, but in Thailand, uh, you'll pretty much see over 500 species in that amount of time, which is quite incredible. Um, it really comes down to where the country is situated, being at a confluence of habitats. Uh, so it's got lowland rainforest influences in the south, Himalayan foothill influences in the north, and a range of other habitats as well, um, including broadleaf woodlands and wetlands and a diverse coastline of estuaries, uh, mudflats, rice paddies, so just a, an enormous variety of habitat. Um, and it's also not only the amazing birds, but the variety of mammals on show as well, plus the super friendly Thai people, uh, which also add to the overall mix and, uh, and really augment the enjoyment of traveling through Thailand. And finally, for those of you who know me well, uh, you'll likely recall that I'm a bit of a foodie and Thailand just happens to have some of the best cuisine in the world. So you throw that all into the mix and you, and you have a really amazing, amazing country. Um, and I personally could carry on raving about Thailand for a long, long time, but this isn't really my show or stage. So joining us today to take us through this remarkable part of the world is Nigel Redman. Um, and really, I couldn't think of anybody better than Nigel to showcase Thailand uh, and all that it has to offer the visiting birder. Nigel is one of Rock Jumper's most traveled guides, having explored most corners of the globe. Uh, for Rock Jumper, Nigel can mostly be found leading tours through Asia and Africa and Europe, while he also is a long-standing guide with our official polar partner, Quark. And uh, during the Southern Polar season, he's a regular on cruises heading south to Antarctica, South Georgia, and the Falkland Islands. Uh, Nigel's also no stranger to our Dream Destination webinar series. Um, many of you will have seen him, seen him presenting before, and he's delved into the heart of Georgia and Armenia for us earlier this year. Well, back in August last year, he took us on a memorable virtual uh, tour through Ethiopia. If you haven't seen any of those webinars yet, please do go and check them out on our website when you get a chance. And as usual, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, and that's going to be Nikki and Nigel providing the entertainment on that front. Uh, if you do have a question, you can use the chat function or the Q&A box. And uh, we also love hearing your comments, so please do send those along as well in the chat function. Um, and on that note, without further delay, let me hand over to Nigel. Uh, I do hope that you all enjoy the presentation this evening. Thank you, Keith, for that very generous introduction. Um, you actually said um, a lot of the reasons for visiting Thailand, you've already said and uh, explained quite a lot about it, but I will try to say a little bit more about it and uh, tell everybody uh, a little bit about Thailand and showcase some of its marvellous birds. So, I'll move us straight on and we're going to start with a map as we usually do. So it's really the situation of Thailand. It's its position in Southeast Asia that uh, is the key to why it has so many birds. It, it, is, the, it is Asia's premier birding destination and quite rightly so. Um, and it is the, probably the most popular birding destination in Asia. And as Keith says, you can see more species in Thailand than than almost any other place that you visit there. So you've got uh, Burma or Myanmar uh, to the north, you've got Laos uh, to the east and Cambodia also to the east or the southeast in fact, and then Malaysia in the south. That is its, uh, um, uh, its position in Southeast Asia. But it's also um, a very strange shaped country. You've got this, this northern continental part of, of Thailand and then the southern part is, is this is the part of the peninsula, the Malaysian peninsula, um, which it shares with Malaysia. And, and this is the key to, to, to what, what is the, so important about uh, uh, Thailand with, for, for its birds. So up in the north, you've got a lot of mountains um, and forested mountains, or, or, or they were, uh, that some of its remnants now. But it's the, it's the southern edge of the, the Himalayas. The, so a lot of Sino-Himalayan influences in the north 
both with breeding species and with wintering birds. In the east, um, I've got my pointer here, in the east you've got the, uh, the Cambodian influence here. So a lot of in Indo-Chinese species can be seen in, in the eastern parts. And then in the south, as I said, you've got the Malaysian inf influence as well. So a lot of Malaysian species reach their northern limits up, up in, up in uh, the northern part of the peninsula here, whereas some of the Himalayan species actually come right down to, to, to reach down here, although most of them stay uh, up in the north. But there are a few things that come down and, and there's obviously a bit of overlap. And then the central part of Thailand is, is plains and, and largely cultivated, not, not a tremendous interest ornithologically. Um, and then Bangkok situated right, right here in, in, the, in the middle at the head of the Gulf of Thailand. So moving on, why do you visit Thailand? Well, is it for the nightlife or is it perhaps for, for the beaches? Well, if you wanted nightlife and beaches, you probably have to go with another tour company because although we do visit beaches and we do go owling at night, uh, our primary focus is birds. So reasons to visit Thailand. Well, number one, spoonbill sandpiper. It is the reason why so many people want to go to Thailand. Spoonbill sandpiper is one of the rarest birds in the world now. Um, its numbers are down to 250 to 450 individual birds. Um, and Thailand holds uh, a few of these. Uh, the, the others are up in um, uh, Bangladesh and, uh, and the coast of uh, Myanmar. But there are regular wintering sites for spoonbill sandpiper in Thailand, and that's one of the things that we will go to see. They're only in winter plumage, but they're still spoonbill sandpipers. Tropical birds, well, and lots of them. There, there are so many birds in Thailand. We will only look at a few of them today. I'll try to show you some of them more special ones. Um, uh, the great diversity of habitats, I've already uh, uh, spoken about that, the Himalayan species in the northern mountains, Indo-Chinese species in the eastern forests, Malaysian species in the southern rainforests, and Palearctic winter visitors throughout if you go in the, uh, the boreal winter season. Fabulous food as Keith mentioned, and it really really is fabulous, um, and good accommodations, spectacular temples, we get to see a few of those, you can't miss them, um, and the beaches of nightlife, not for us. So the birding highlights, spoonbill sandpiper, of course, that's the main highlight, but on top of that you've got 14 species of pitters, seven species of broadbill, nine species of pheasants, and 33 species of philoscopus warblers. I should add, we won't see 14 species of pitters on the tour, uh, we will see a few, and we will probably see all seven species of broadbill. Uh, nine species of pheasant, well, if, if we see one or two, they're very shy. If we see one or two, we'll be lucky, but we should see one or two. And philoscopus warblers, well, we won't see all 33, but we'll almost certainly see uh, 20 or more. Um, and and they, the philoscopus warblers are really the Asian equivalent of cysticulars in Africa. So you love them or hate them and they're often quite hard to identify unless you hear them, um, but they're great fun. Uh, they're, not, they're not as colourful as American warblers, but they're wonderful. Loads of woodpeckers, barbits, hornbills, pigeons, cuckoos, minivets, bulbuls, babblers, laughing thrushes, warblers, chats, flycatchers, sunbirds and flowerpeckers. Lots of them and they're wonderful. So the country list in Thailand is, is currently about a thousand and fifty species. It does depend on your taxonomy. Um, and then of that there are about 20 endemics and near endemics. Now this is a, a, a greyer area. There are probably only three true endemics to Thailand. So the rest are, are near endemics. But because of it sharing its habitats with, with other faunal regions, you don't really get that many endemics. So, so there, but there are 20 or so um, near endemics. Um, and we'll see a few of those. And then on the regular tour, which is 18, currently 18 days plus the seven day extension, you can expect to see around 550 species, uh, which maybe 60, 70 or 80 perhaps even would be just down in the peninsula. Um, and the highlights tour, which is 13 days, can expect around 400 species. So just looking at this map, um, so the, the, we, we call our tours north and central with a southern extension and it's a very apt description because we start a 
on the Gulf of Thailand, with where we looked for, for waders and our spoon-billed sandpiper. And then we head across to Kankrachan. My internet connection is apparently unstable. I hope you can still hear me. We then go to Kankrachan, where we spend a, a, few, a few nights. And then we drive up, skirting around Bangkok, up to Khao Yai National Park, another premier national park. And that's the central part. We then go up to the north to Chiang Mai. We fly to the north to Chiang Mai, and uh, we we've, we we ping in. And we do these places up near Fang, up the east border. Uh, that we do Doi Lang, Doi Kang, and Taton up in the up in the north, and that's the the northern section. And then the south in the peninsula, we fly down to Krabi here, and we we do Pang Bay, we do Khao Noi Chu Chi. We do three Pang Na and we do the Similan Islands. So let's move straight on. So when we leave Bangkok, we don't spend any time in Bangkok. We drive southwest and we go down to, um, we, uh, we drive down to Kankrachan, but on the way, we stop in the Pechaburi area where there are these extensive areas of salt, salt pans. And there's varying amounts of water levels in, in these salt pans. But if you search around and you find good pans, you can find a host of wintering waders. These are great knots. Um, great knots occur in large numbers. But there are also sand plovers. There's, there's lots of gray plovers. There's teric sandpipers, broad-billed sandpipers, um, and some a smattering of rare waders as well. So Asian dowitcher, there's one of the specialities we'll be, be looking for. Uh, smallish numbers of Asian dowitchers occur here. Um, and also Nordman's greenshank, which is a real speciality. Uh, that breeds only on the island of Sakhalin um, up in uh, Russia. Um, and it winters down in Southeast Asia. It's, a, it's thicker build and a bit shorter legged than the common greenshank. And, and you, the bill is usually a two-tone color, which you can just see there. Uh, but we should see a few of those as well after a bit of searching. But that's what we're after, spoon-billed sandpiper. That's the prize in, in winter plumage. And, um, and hopefully we'll find uh, two or three of these uh, mixed in with all the redneck stints and the other small peeps that uh, are wintering on these salt pans. Um, one of the, the, the main area for the spoon-billed sandpiper is called Pactali. And this uh, area of, of salt pans has recently been purchased and it's going to be managed, or it is being managed, as a, a, a reserve for spoon-billed sandpiper, which is fantastic. So um, the, uh, the, the Thai, uh, Thai birders have really got on top of this, and they're, they're doing uh, all they can to protect this really endangered bird. So very close to the salt pans, there's an area of mangroves that we will visit, um, and we have to get on a little boat to, to, to get out to the mangroves and we go out to the to the coast um, um, an area of coastal um, beach which is uh, not frequented by tourists where we can look for a few good birds uh, on the right of the picture there is Utai Trisukon who is our usually our, our guide in Thailand uh, he is probably Thai, uh, Thailand's top birder he's brilliant in the field so in in the mangroves a common bird is this Malaysian pied fantail uh, frequently seen waving their tails uh, in the mangroves. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common bird and quite widespread. And the fly eater or golden bellied gerigine uh, also occurs, a little bit uh, scarcer, might have to look a bit harder for that. It's, the, it's a member of an Australian family, it's one of the Australian thornbill family, the gerigines, and this is the most northerly counterpart, that uh, the only species of the family that's crossed Wallace's line into uh, into Southeast Asia. Uh, Blue-tailed bee eaters uh, are quite common open country birds. We should see those hawking around over the mangroves. And then when we get to this sandbar at the end, uh, we'll be looking for this Malaysian plover. Um, we are, might also see the white-faced plover as well, uh, which is a, a, a recently um, recognised uh, form of Kentish plover, or alternatively regarded as a, a full species. Um, and uh, also at this area is, uh, is often a good place to look for Chinese egret. This is one of the uh, scarcer um, herons, um, quite similar to, to the other white egrets, uh, but small numbers winter here. 
um, in, in, in Thailand. And the features to look for here is that uh, unlike um, uh, some of the other egrets, like uh, little egret, uh, the Chinese egret in winter retains its plumes, quite a lot of plumes still, even in winter. It's got this quite thick bill that is largely blackish with a yellow base. Uh, it's got this uh, grayish sort of um, uh, bare skin on the laws and also these greenish legs. So uh, Chinese egret, a good bird to see. Then moving on to Kankrachan. Kankrachan is, uh, uh, is, is Thailand's largest national park. Um, it's over 3,000 3, square kilometers and its, its bird list is over 420 species. The great thing about this park is it's a really heavily densely forested park, but it goes from, from very low altitudes right up to high altitudes. So you get a full range of, of birds. And you can do it all more or less from one road that goes up. It's lowest level, and then it becomes a, a, um, from the headquarters area, it becomes a dirt road after that. And we usually have to transfer into different vehicles to get up to the higher levels. But we'll spend two days in this park. Uh, we'll spend a day at the lower levels and a day at the higher levels in all probability. And the interesting thing is you see different birds. You see different birds on each day. It's, it's, it's quite incredible, actually, that a day spent at lower levels and a day spent at high levels, there will be surprisingly little overlap in what you see each day. But it's a fantastic place and there are lots of birds. Uh, this, is a, a, this is one of our a lunch break it, um, on, on the way up through the park, just on the roadside. It's quiet. There aren't many cars. So, so it's, a, it's great. You can just have a have a break uh, uh, for lunch anywhere really along the road and watch birds. So black-thighed falconet is a is a um, fairly frequently seen species. It's a, one of the very world's smallest falcons um, and it likes perching on these open um, snags uh, of trees. So this this pair had a, a nest just nearby. Uh, flower peckers um, like um, small related to some birds. Uh, there's a number of different species of flowerpecker. This is fire-breasted, which is one of the commoner varieties. Um, and streaked spider hunter. There are eight species of spider hunter recorded in Thailand. Most of them are in the peninsula, but uh, streaked, which is this one, and little are more widespread species. Um, it's a, they're magnificent uh, birds. Flycatchers, a whole array of flycatchers. I didn't really mention much about flycatchers, but there are a hill blue flycatcher, um, but there are many other uh, flycatchers and we'll get to grips with quite a few during our visit. Likewise, bulbuls, lots of bulbuls in Thailand. I haven't got a huge number of photos of bulbuls. They're not, they're, they're, they can be a bit tricky to identify. Uh, a lot of them are brown. Um, some of them got a bit of green on as well, but this is one of the better looking ones. It's mountain bulbul found in uh, Kankrachang at the higher levels and also found up in the north when we go up there. Uh, a lot of the babblers and laughing thrushes. These are lesser necklace laughing thrushes. These, um, um, they go around in quite big groups. Sometimes the lesser necklace and greater necklace go around in mixed groups. Uh, even, but uh, but they go around in big parties, and a lot of the babblers actually are, are, are go around in mixed feeding parties as well. And so we just have to hope that we will uh, luck in and uh, uh, come across a few of these parties. Uh, Blythe shrike babbler used to be called white browed shrike babbler, um, one of the smarter babblers, a really gorgeous um, species, and. Uh, we should see a few of these. It's a, it's a fairly common and it's fairly widespread. It's been the, the white the old white browed shrike babbler as was has been split into several species now. And the one that occurs here is blithes. Spot neck babbler. That's that's actually one of the harder, uh, a little bit harder one to get. Um, didn't see it on my last tour there uh, to Thailand, but uh, but. These things are a bit hit and miss. You either run into a little group or not. Um, but spot neck babbler is one of uh, a number of, uh, of similar looking babblers. This one is a little bit uh, showier than some because uh, many of them are brown. And the gorgeous sultan tit. Oh, who doesn't want to see one of those? 
uh, uh, must be the best member of the tit family. It's, it's, it's quite an outrageous species and it's, it's not uncommon. That uh, yellow crest. Um, and the collared owlet is a little um, uh, owlet that occurs uh, throughout really it's it's a it's a common bird it often calls during the day and um, we can uh, uh, sometimes uh, it, uh, small birds are attracted by the call and come down to mob it uh, so that's also can be quite handy um, for looking for other birds barbets lots and lots of barbets in in thailand um, fruiting trees is, is the key to seeing barbets uh, it in, when you're in in big in rainforest, uh, it can be a bit frustrating because you hear barbets pretty much all the time. But if you're actually in the forest, it can be quite hard to see. And that's uh, another of the advantage of having a nice road at Kanka Chan because you can travel up and uh, if you can find a fruiting tree. You can just scope the tree and uh, hopefully uh, see a few different species of barbets. They often se see several species in one tree. So this is blue throated, one of the smaller barbets. Um, and one of the more familiar sounds of the, the forests, especially of southern Thailand. Moustached barbet also is a quite a common species in, um, in Kankrachang and, and elsewhere as well. And then higher up is the great barbet, it used to be called the great Himalayan barbet. It's, a, it's the biggest of the barbets, it's a huge thing. And this has got a very distinctive duetting call, uh, which carries for miles um, up in the hills. Um, and you you hear it all the time. Uh, seeing one can it, it can be trickier, but it's a, such a familiar sound of the of the hill forests of Thailand and and indeed in the Himalayas throughout the Himalayas. Red bearded bee eater, one of the gorgeous bee eaters to see. It's a forest species, and this is a southern species. So this is a, a bird that occurs in in Malaysia, um, and it gets up at its northernmost limit pretty much at Kangra Chan. And interestingly, the blue bearded beater, which is a, a bird of the Himalayas, really, that comes south and also occurs in Kangra Chan and reaches its southern limit there. So here we got two similar species which, uh, which actually meet. Great slaty woodpecker. This is the largest woodpecker in Asia and it usually goes round in noisy flocks. It's a magnificent bird uh, can be seen here. There are other sites that we can see it as well uh, on our visit. Uh, it's quite a widespread species. It occurs from from the Himalayas right through right down south through all of Southeast Asia. Uh, but it's a it's a, it's a wonderful bird. Um, chestnut headed bee eater is a a, a forest species of bee eater. Oh, uh, flocks of these will quite often be seen hawking over the forest. And uh, orange-breasted trogon. Um, this is uh, uh, one of several species of trogon. There are more in the peninsula, uh, only two species up in the uh, in main northern and central Thailand. Uh, Orange-breasted is one of the smaller trogons. You've got a male on the left and a female on the right. Kingfishers, quite a few kingfishers in Thailand. They're always popular. Uh, banded kingfisher is a forest kingfisher. Uh, again, can be a little tricky to find, but well worth it if you can. Uh, this is a male. It's a, a fabulous bird. Um, banded kingfisher. And hornbills. Plenty of hornbills as well. Um, this is a great hornbill. Um, and uh, these, these are the biggest, uh, pretty much the biggest uh, hornbills actually down in the peninsula. There are, there's helmeted and rhinoceros, but they're both quite difficult to see down there, um, easier further south. But great hornbill is a widespread species from, from India right through the, into Southeast Asia. It's a truly, truly magnificent hornbill. Broadbills are always popular birds, and uh, I, I said before that there are seven possible species to see in Thailand, and pretty all can be seen on, on this tour. So this is black and red. Red, um, one of the common species, but, uh, but uh, gettable in Kanker Chan. Banded broadbill, uh, that's uh, also fairly widespread, a really spectacular looking broadbill. They have these huge colourful bills. 
and long tail, one of my favorites, uh, often in little groups like this little group that uh, showed up on my last trip while, while we were having lunch. Uh, terrific birds. And one of the real specialities of Kankrachang is ratchet tailed tree pie. It's only it's a member of the crow family. Uh, it, front half, it doesn't look very much really. It just looks fairly crow like, I suppose. But it has this extraordinary tail, which uh, on the right there, the um, uh, the photograph, the silhouette photograph on the right actually shows you how extraordinary that tail really is. Um, and it's a very special bird because it mainly occurs in Indochina, in parts of Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. Um, and then it's this population, this group here in, in Kankrachang and over into the, onto the Burmese border is, is completely disjunct. It's quite a, a long way uh, uh, separated from the, uh, the main population. And uh, it was only discovered in Thailand relatively recently. So it's a special bird and we have a, a good chance of finding it in Kankrachang. Uh, there are a few um, mammals to be seen too. Dusky leaf monkey is uh, uh, is one of the uh, regular monkeys we see. We could see banded leaf monkey there. Uh, could see some macaques. Um, elephants occur, but they are not usually seen. Um, but there are bits and pieces. But it's not so big on mammals in Kangrechan. If you actually spent some time creeping around in the forest, you might see a lesser mouse deer. These are very very small deer that live in the forest, but they're pretty shy and um, and it, they are not often seen. Um, this I took this from a, a little hide that I was in once and uh, it just came creeping across in front. And I'm putting in a couple of photographs of birds we've not seen yet on a on a tour, um, but these were taken in Kankrachan and these are red leg crake. Red leg crake is a summer, it's a forest crake and it's a summer visitor. Uh, to, to the region, um, but it's very shy and it's very, very difficult to see. Um, uh, and it was a new bird for me when I saw this. And half an hour later, I saw this slaty leg crake, which is also a bird that we've not yet seen uh, but uh, on at all, but it is in Kankrachang and it is possible. And this is resident in, in Kankrachang, another forest crake and also equally difficult to see normally. And these are my last two mainland crakes for, for rails and crakes for Southeast Asia. So very nice. So moving on now to Khao Yai National Park to the northeast of um, Bangkok. It is probably Thailand's most famous park. It's certainly its most visited. It's within easy reach of Bangkok and it's enormously popular with, uh, with Thais who go there for, for weekends or for a party or people go there for weddings. So it's a, it's a well used park, but it's a it's a huge area of uh, dense evergreen forest. It's got a, a limited number of roads that go through it, which uh, ease access, and there are some good trails, um, and there's good facilities as well as restaurants and so on. So it's a, it's a great park, um, and it's easy to get away from from all the visitors, and uh, there are lots and lots of birds to see here. It's quite nice, a nice thing in Thailand, you see temples everywhere and this little temple is actually inside the park in, uh, in Khao Yai. So what birds can we see? Well, we see more laughing thrushes. We could have seen white crested laughing thrush at Kankra Chan. It's, uh, it's quite a widespread species. It is, it is one of the best thrushes at uh, least. Um, and it goes around in quite big groups as a rule, um, often single species groups. So white crested laughing thrush is one we'll be looking for. Black throated laughing thrush is, a, is another one, a little harder, but we should see a few of these. Uh, white rump sharma is, a, is quite a, a widespread um, species, member of the chat family, forest species. It's, 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 it's a fairly common bird. You hear it more than you see it, uh, but it's a, a lovely bird when you do. Uh, a number of sunbirds. Uh, this is black throated sunbird. Um, I always think that name is uh, does it doesn't really do it justice. It's a it's a gorgeous looking sunbird and it has got a black throat, so I guess that's fine. So black throated sunbird is another species, um, and uh, again a, a number of flycatchers occur in Khao Yai. Hainan blue is one of the specialities there, really um, uh, hard hard to see 
perhaps elsewhere, but it's uh, it's quite commonly seen in Kauai, mainland blue flycatcher. Mugi Maki is a is a winter visitor from 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 Asia, from northern Asia, um, that, that comes down into South anywhere really. Um, this is a, a male, very smart looking flycatcher. And starlings, I haven't said anything much about starlings yet, but there are a number of them. The, the common hill miner is the um, is one of the more spectacular species of the starling family. Uh, we will see quite a few starlings uh, on the tour, um, half a dozen species perhaps. Uh, the common hill miner is the, is the most impressive and of course this is the bird that unfortunately a lot of people like to keep in cages because they can sometimes talk. Forktails lovely family of, uh, of uh, strictly Asian species, uh, members of the chat family that live mostly by rivers, along rivers, although some, some do spend some time inside the forest, but they are particularly um, associated with rivers. And actually likes the really small forested streams rather than the bigger rivers. Um, and uh, one's first view of, a, of one of these is usually a very high pitched piercing scream as it flies off when you as you disturb it when you when you're walking along um, and you might see might see it or you might not but uh, when you see when you do see them well they're really worth seeing they all all the six seven species in the family all have long tails except for one um, like this this is the white crown which is one of the larger ones Philoscopus warblers, barely touched on these yet. Um, there are a lot of Philoscopus warblers uh, and quite a few of them are resident species like this one, sulfur-breasted in, in Kauai. But there are also a lot of migrant um, Philoscopus warblers that come down and winter in Southeast Asia from, from more northerly parts of Asia, such as this, which is Rad's warbler. Um, this is browner um, and bigger and uh, this sticks close to the ground usually um, um, and you, it, invariably it is first detected um, from its uh, call notes uh, but it often calls quite frequently uh, from the undergrowth um, and it's not it's more from a hillside or, or but it's a it's a fairly common winter visitor but can be hard to see Red jungle fowl, that's a chicken to, to most people, I suppose, but uh, it's a, a wild bird and they are magnificent. Uh, they really, they really are magnificent. Um, and you hear them quite a lot. And there are places, uh, edge of forests and open clearings are the place to look for those. And in Khao Yai, where this was taken, uh, you quite often see them um, early morning or maybe late in the afternoon um, coming out onto the edge. And, uh, uh, and, and they, the males are truly, truly magnificent. So red jungle fowl, the ancestor of the domestic chicken. Thrushes. Um, thrushes are always popular, always well worth seeing. This is an orange headed thrush or orange headed ground thrush. It's um, um, quite a shy species, but it's fairly widespread and not uncommon. Uh, but you don't, it's not always easy to see. Um, this was uh, one I photographed on my last visit uh, just on the edge of a uh, of a little clearing. But uh, orange headed ground thrush is a spectacular thrush. Uh, white throated rock thrush is actually uh, a migrant. It's a, a winter visitor into uh, Thailand or into Southeast Asia. Uh, this one breeds up in eastern Siberia in the forests of eastern Siberia. It's a true forest thrush and uh, it winters, winters, you can see it in Khao Yai and in, in various other places in Thailand. Um, this is a Siberian blue robin, um, a famously quite difficult bird to see when uh, when breeding in, in Siberia and uh, and it's pretty difficult even in winter I suppose, but it's not uncommon, it's, it is actually quite a common winter bird and if you once once it's call, it's rather rather um, quiet call is learnt then uh, you find you, you you find you see more, but um, they can, they are really quite common um, that when I was in Kangkrachang uh, on one occasion I, I saw, um, it, when I was just sitting quietly in one spot, I saw more than 15 um, just in one area. So maybe they all just arrived then, I don't know, it was, it was in October. 
but uh, Siberian blue robin is is a, a really wonderful looking bird. It's a, this is a male. I mentioned there were two trogons in the north and central part of the tour, and this is the other. This is the red-headed trogon. This is a female. The male actually does have a red head, um, but the female is pretty special too. So this is red-headed trogon um, occurs from from the Himalayas, eastern Himalayas, direct down down into uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, gets as far down as Malaysia. Pitters. Well, obviously everyone wants to see pitters. This is a blue pitter, and this is a cow yai speciality, really. Um, obviously, it does occur elsewhere, but cow yai is the, one of the best, um, easiest places to see it. You can see it at Kangri Chang as well. But seeing it well is, is the challenge. Um, sometimes we do, and sometimes we struggle a bit harder, but uh, they, they are magnificent um, species. Uh, this is a this is blue, blue pitter. Um, Another species of pitter in Khao Yai, and a little harder to see normally than, than blue pitter, is eared pitter. Um, and this one is not the greatest of photos, but because I was actually peering into a, a, a bush where it was largely obscured, and it was a question of just finding a little, little bit where I could actually get the lens and to, and to try to photograph the bird. It actually stayed in that bush, in that little dense bush, for about an hour. And this is the best I could manage in terms of a photo. Uh, but that's a special bird, eared pitter. Um, another shy bird of the of the forest undergrowth is uh, is a green leg partridge. There are a number of partridges that you can see on the tour, but they can be quite difficult. This is uh, one of the lowland uh, uh, forests, uh, lowland evergreen forests, and um, green leg partridge, not uncommon, but just hard to see. And even harder to see, coral ground cuckoo. I've only ever seen it once. Um, uh, it's it's actually a tough bird, um, but it does. Uh, there are places where you can look for it. Um, sometimes they they cross over uh, clearings or uh, uh, cr cross tracks at some regular points. Um, every now and again, uh, one becomes habituated to feeding at uh, at um, uh, waste. Uh, near, near the buildings uh, in the headquarters where they actually throw out their food waste or rubbish pits or whatever sometimes they come to there but uh, you've got to be a bit lucky to see one of these um, but it, we will try it's one of the special birds of Kauai. Uh, pheasants, uh, pheasants are always difficult, uh, silver pheasant um, sometimes these can be seen uh, up uh, one of the higher points um, uh, there's a road that goes up to a a peak in, in Khao Yai that you can drive up and uh, silver pheasants can sometimes be seen there and when you see them you often see them in small groups. Uh, this was one of a, a, a group of five that, uh, that took on my last trip. Silver pheasant. And this is the other pheasant speciality. Um, it's found in Khao Yai um, and there are a couple of other places where you can go to look for it as well. But Siamese fireback, it's a, it is a, a fabulous bird. Um, I think it's Thai, Thailand's national bird. Um, it's a terrific bird. And um, obviously this is a male and we have very good chance of finding this on the top. Siamese fireback, just, uh, just enjoy that a bit longer. Mammals, um, northern pigtailed macaques. Um, they're very common in Thailand. You see big troops of those on the roadside. Uh, they go around in big gangs um, with with adult uh, alpha males and, uh, and and females and young, and they're always entertaining to watch. Uh, squirrels, quite a few different species of squirrels in Southeast Asia. Um, the largest of these, the black giant squirrels, there's two, there's two here um, that were showing quite well. Um, and uh, they're about twice the size of all the other squirrels. So black giant squirrels. Um, porcupines, they're usually nocturnal, uh, but we found this one um, um, on a recent tour that uh, uh, we found during the day and it was actually scrubbing around the, uh, the back of, uh, of some of the houses that the staff live in. And, uh, and it was quite unafraid really, and so um, I, my lens was a bit too big for it, it was actually a bit too close, which is uh, why it looks like this. Um, gibbons, um, there's white-handed or la 
gibbon um, uh, is is a common sound in in cow yai um they're all around you and um seeing them is often a bit harder um uh, they they come in dark uh, black and and also in uh, paler brown color uh, like that one but you also get the pileated i haven't got a photograph of that uh, the pileated has got a completely different sound um it uh, uh, from from the uh, white handed um, and there are uh, small differences in, uh, in, in in when you see them as well. Uh, pileated, not seen every trip. This was a a, a lucky photo, Gower. Um, you don't see, they're in the forest, but you don't see them very often. Um, uh, I think I've only seen one once actually in in Khao Yai. Um, but uh, this is a fine herd of of Gower. It's a it's a uh, a forest species. There's another similar thing called Banteng, which you get down further south. Um, and in Cambodia, you've got a, a cupre, which may actually be extinct, which are uh, all similar um, kinds of, um, of animals to, to the gaur. And another difficult one. Um, well, th this is a Chinese serao, um, and um, I've not seen it very often, but, the, but uh, a mother and a youngster came walking past us when we were trying to look at silver pheasants um, uh, on, on a recent trip and uh, and I managed to get a few pictures of it a Chinese serow it's normally quite a, a shy um, species of, uh, of antelope elephants also they they they, they we, we warn people that you don't really see elephants very often in Kauai and we don't see it every trip but uh, but sometimes you do and this one is a perfectly wild elephant that just came up came out and was walking down the road uh, so uh, which was great fun but uh, but yep sometimes you see them and sometimes you don't and then near Kauai uh, we we usually visit a, a, a monastery in an area of limestone hills where we look for this very special bird a limestone wren babbler it's uh, very localized. Um, it's only found at a few sites. Uh, HBW actually now splits it into two species, which makes this one um, entirely endemic to Thailand. Uh, the other form, which is the uh, Rufus, uh, this is the Rufus, the other form, the gray limestone wren babbler occurs up in the, on the west and occurs into Myanmar as well. But it's a special bird, limestone wren babbler. And then just look, look back, looking back at the map now, we've done the center. We're going to go up to the north, Chiang Mai, Mei Ping, Doi and Tanon, and then these three areas up in the north, which I'll treat more or less together. So uh, Mei Ping, um, it's an area of dry diptrocarp forests. Um, it's got dry diptrocarp just means deciduous, really. They're deciduous trees, mainly of Shoria species and also some teaks. Um, and uh, it's a it's, it's got a number of uh, birds. It's quite good for woodpeckers and especially this, which is black-headed woodpecker, which is a, a real speciality. It's a fantastic looking woodpecker uh, and it likes that, that these areas. You also get the white-bellied woodpecker, which is a second largest species in, in Asia. White-bellied woodpecker also occurs there. Uh, also this thing, the, the little grey-capped woodpecker is found there and also greater flameback. Uh, that's a, a bit more widespread or both both great capped and greater flame back flame back are a bit more widespread um, but they like these dry diptrocarps forests as does the the burmese nuthatch and uh, and also the red there are a few we go there so it's worth going to the morning there it gets very hot in these forests um uh, by sort of later in the morning so we just usually do a, an early morning in these forests for a few special birds and then we move on and then we had we might stop at a temple uh, on the way um that's always a, a, a nice thing to do um and there we can look for a, a green peafowl um but this one is uh, not tickable but the real thing is really worth seeing. And there's a, a place near to Chiang Mai, uh, the Hong, um, oh, I, can, I can never remember the name of it, the uh, Huai Hong Krai. Uh, it's the King's Project, and they protect this area of forest where green peafowl occur, and uh, they're usually relatively easy to see there. 
Um, it's a magnificent bird. Um, its distribution is now fairly patchy. Um, it, it occurs all the way down to Java, um, but uh, uh, only in a few sites. Uh, it's, uh, it's obviously considerably reduced in its range, unlike the, the blue peafowl in India, where, which is still pretty common uh, throughout most of India, but the green is, uh, is a much more um, threatened bird. So truly, truly wonderful species to see. And then on to Doi Intanon. Doi Intanon is um, Thailand's highest mountain. Um, and like Kangra Chang, it's forested all the way from, from the bottom to the top, really. And there's a good road all the way up. It's actually tarmac all the way up. So it's a, it's a fantastic um, uh, uh, reserve, national park, in fact. The top is 2,565 metres, and there are at least 380 species recorded from the park. So this is the where we stay, um, which is a, a, a very nicely appointed lodge with great gardens just outside the national park. So going straight up, we spent two days there. We certainly on one of the days, at least we would drive straight to the top and look around the top in the early part of the morning. Um, we will often share that with the sightseers who go up to the like to go up to the top of Doyington on to watch the sunrise. Um, but uh, we keep, try to keep out of their way. But at the top there's rhododendron forests and uh, some nice areas to look for some special birds. So this is one of the one of the special birds. This is green-tailed sunbird, but the it's a, 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 of an endemic race. The race here, uh, sometimes it's actually called Doyintanon sunbird. It's this race is only found on Doyintanon. It is endemic to the mountain and uh, and may or may even prove to be a separate species one day. Who knows? So that's green-tailed sunbird. And it's, it's common. It's easy to see um, at the top there. Uh, the other bird that's quite easy to see is, is Mrs. Gould sunbird. Um, this is a, a more uh, quite a widespread species. Uh, occurs in a number of races from, from the Himalayas all the way down to, to northwest Thailand. And also a spectacular looking sunbird. If you're lucky, we might bump into a wintering Eurasian woodcock. Um, it's always a possibility. There's a there's a, a nice damp area with a with a boardwalk trail at the top, which we look at, and it sometimes holds rare thrushes and flycatchers and stuff. Um, and if you're lucky, a woodcock. Uh, Rufous-throated partridge is also a possibility up there. It's a, a it's a shy bird as a rule, but uh, it's one of the one of the birds to look for. The pygmy cupwing, I'm getting used to calling it that. I always used to know it as pygmy wren babbler. Uh, one of my favorite birds, I have to say. It's a, it's, they're, they're tiny little tailless things um, and they're very hard to see uh, or can be very hard to see. You need to put a bit of effort into them. They can, they can be calling all around you and hopping around and still you're not getting much, of, much in the way of views. I suppose, a, I, I, I suppose, um, there are quite a few skulkers like that, but uh, but I, and I always find that they're the most interesting. So this is pygmy coupling. It's a very small one, um, uh, rembabla. It's it occurs again fairly. It's fairly widespread, but just not not easy to see. Bar throated minler. That's a speciality found on the top of uh, of top of Doyington on. Um, you usually see a few of those. Um, it's not it's not so hard. Uh, often in small flocks of these, even bar throated members. It's a babbler. It's one of the babblers. Babblers is a catch-all really, and they've been split into several families these days. But but uh, it's a catch-all group really. Um, there are lots of different kinds of babblers. So laughing thrushes, of course, separated now from from actual babblers, but uh, but uh, similar kinds of birds and lots of species of laughing thrushes. Silver-eared is uh, is fairly common on the top of Doyentanon. Uh, we'll see it further north as well. And the uh, dark-back Sibia, uh, that's another, that's a near endemic in fact in, in really in Thailand, occurs in Myanmar as well. And also the spectacle barwing is also a, a near endemic um, in, uh, in northern Thailand. Uh, but these birds uh, you might you might notice there's a banana there, uh, which is not actually accidental. Uh, but if you put a banana or two down, uh, these birds will come in, and the photographers uh, love to take pictures of them. 
so including me. Silvery amnesia um, is another one of the babblers that uh, occurs in often occurs in small flocks. It's a it's a really bright, good, gorgeous looking bird, and often fairly easy to find, usually in flocks. So sil silver eared amnesia. Great. around and they um, uh, most of them are the males are red and black and the females are yellow and black uh, this one is is orange um, uh, this is a male and uh, they're lovely birds um, and uh, Doynton on is a good place to look for grey chin minivet large niltava is one of the larger species of flycatchers that you find in um, uh, and it's it, it's often a bit skulking and in likes the darker recesses of the forest, but but you can easily find the, find large niltavas uh, on Doyntonon. Slaty back flycatcher is a is a winter visitor to to, to Thailand. Um, it's a, a very distinctive. It's very grey above and with lovely orange breast. But it's very distinctive. And yellow-bellied fantail. Um, th this is actually called uh, yellow-bellied fairy fantail these days uh, because it's different from the other fantails. Uh, but yellow-bellied fantail is 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 a good enough name for it. It it, it fans its tail like the other fantails, but it's a uh, it's uh, very distinctive with this black mask uh, and yellow supercilium and yellow underparts, uh, and it's a fairly common uh, forest species. Barbets, you've got a, a, a slightly different selection of barbets. Golden throated is one of the species to look for up in the north. Golden throated barbet. Uh, there are different forms of this, which uh, may or may not be different species, but uh, we'll call it golden throated for the moment. White catwater redstart. This is uh, a bird that is very strongly associated with, uh, with uh, rivers and uh, streams and uh, is a, a very beautiful bird. There's a a place on Doyens and on where we can reliably find the white-capped water red star. I love teasias. Teasias are also known as ground warblers. Uh, fantastic birds. Not very many species. There's the, the chestnut-headed is possibly the most spectacular one, uh, which I don't have a photograph of. Uh, this is slaty-bellied. There's also a grey-bellied and there's a, another one on Java. Um, but they're great birds. Um, they, they're almost tailless. They're, they keep to the really low levels of the forest, the forest floor. You can see how strong the legs are and it just bounds around on the forest floor, but they are difficult to see. You've got to, you've got to put a bit of time and effort into looking for these, but well worth the effort. Slaty bellied teasia. And of course, like most of these ground birds, you're usually attracted to them by, by hearing them first. Chestnut crown warbler. This is uh, is uh, also another. Uh, uh, well, actually, it's a philoscopus again these days. It's one of the bright ones. It used to be in a different genus, um, but it's um, it's a lovely, one of the most uh, uh, better looking uh, philoscopus type warblers. Beautiful bird, chestnut crown warbler. And then black tail crake. It's it's quite a difficult bird to see. Quite a Shy bird, not a huge range. It occurs from the eastern Himalayas south to here, but um, never an easy bird to see. But uh, it is reliably found on Doi and Tanon. Um, there's an area where, where, where you can go and, uh, and uh, it might just run across some open ground like this one did. And uh, it's a great bird, um, black-tailed crake. And I put this in for some of my fellow leaders who I know are still looking for it, but uh, green gachoa. Gachoas are, are really uh, uh, members of the, of the thrush family. There's only four species of gachoa, but they're always very low density and they're very shy. And they, they, you just very, very rarely do you run into a gachoa. And the best looking one is this one, green gachoa. This photo was actually taken by our driver. Um, because uh, his photo was better than mine, uh, Jiang, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. But uh, it, it was a long way away, and we heard it calling first, and then we scoped it, and we had quite decent scope views uh, in the distance. It didn't come any closer, but it stayed there for quite a while, and uh, and called fairly early one morning on the on the slopes of Doyntonon, 
Uh, the other cachoa in Thailand is purple cachoa, which is uh, probably even harder to see in, in Thailand. Um, and uh, it occurs at a few other places. And then there's another one on Sumatra, another one on Java. And that's it on cachoas. But green cachoa is definitely one of the top birds to look for. So moving on, moving north from um, um, from uh, Doi Intanon, we move, go to the just up to the Burmese border. Um, Doi, Jang, Doi Chang Dao has got a lovely uh, temple and it's got some fine forests. We, we, we only pay a short visit there, uh, but, but on the way. Um, but you can see, still find a good few good birds there. Might see bay woodpecker there um, or might see uh, silver breasted broadbill. It's, um, it's a more uh, you can get that in several different places, but I'm, that's one place where I have seen it. Um, but Doi Chang Dao is, uh, is, a, is a nice little area. But moving further on to Doi Ang Kang, uh, which is up on the Burmese border, this is the lodge that we uh, used to stay at. Um, and uh, it's a lovely, lovely lodge, great gardens again, and lots of good birding nearby. So it's, as I said, it's right on the border of Thailand. That hill in the distance is, is actually Myanmar. Um, that's the border. Um, and obviously we're standing in Thailand, those are the Thai flags. Um, so uh, great birding, lots of um, little uh, forest um, patches in that area. Uh, Dorian Redstart is a, a winter visitor from, from uh, Asia, Eastern Asia. Um, and there's usually a few, one or two around in the, the Doyang Kang area. Uh, Rufus bellied Nil Tava doesn't come from as far, but it, it winters also in, uh, Thai, in northwest Thailand from the Himalayas. Rufus bellied Nil Tava. This is a resident, uh, one of the better looking bulbuls. This is crested finchbill, spectacular looking bulbul, really, with that crest and a nice thick bill. Um, and that's uh, easily found in the area. And striated bulbul is another fairly good looking bulbul um, of the area. Laughing thrushes, a few, one or two more new species of laughing thrush up here. Uh, white browed is this one. It's not not the most spectacular looking, but uh, it's a it's a good one to get. Um, we'll we will look hard for that. Rufus gorgetted flycatcher is another flycatcher that occurs uh, in the winter time. As a excuse me, wintering from southeast, uh, wintering from the Himalayas. And uh, chestnut bellied rock thrush um, is a uh, a very spectacular uh, member of the rock thrush family. It's a, a resident species. Red flank blue tail now split into two species. Um, they're fairly similar, different, difficult to tell apart. Um, uh, this one um, is presumably a, 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 an actual red flank blue tail, but the other, which comes from further afield, it's a winter visitor from. From, from Asia, it's got a widespread range really right across Eurasia. And then the other one is Himalayan uh, blue tail, which occurs mainly in the Himalayas and Southern China. Uh, Burmese shrike um, also is, a, is a, well, it, it's a resident in forest edge up in this area. Um, it, uh, it winters throughout much of central Thailand as well, but uh, it also breeds up in the north, uh, a bit harder to see. Um, like these pine trees. And spot-breasted parrotbill is, um, is well worth looking for. Doi, any of these northern mountains, um, uh, extraordinary huge bill, uh, likes bamboo uh, especially of course, um, and usually uh, usually see in small groups. Uh, this is spot-breasted parrotbill. Um, Black-eyed shike babbler is uh, um, now considered to be related to virios rather than actually a, a babbler but uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a tiny one uh, much smaller than the blithes which I showed you earlier so this is black-eared shrike babbler and the scimitar babblers there's a few species of scimitar babblers this is white-browed scimitar babbler and then this is rusty cheeked scimitar babbler um, and these uh, uh, are, are tend to go around more on their own really rather than in flocks White-tailed blue robin, another spectacular member of the chat family. I do particularly like chats. This one uh, has has very obvious white patches in its tail, which it uh, quite often helpfully uh, fans, uh, flicks its tail. Um, it's a shy bird, um, but uh, with patience, uh, you can see the see them sometimes. 
quite relatively easily. Uh, Black-breasted thrush is a, a winter visitor from the north, and um, uh, this is a male, and, uh, and there's a few of these that you can see in the Doyan Kang area. And then if you go out at night, you might um, probably here you might see it and if you might even luckily find one in the daytime but uh, but I've not done that but uh, but yes they, they, it's it's quite um, uh, frequently seen in the in the forests around Ankang. Hodgson's frog mouth. And then sort of moving up to Doi Lang where there are more a few more pine trees really um, uh, slightly uh, it's 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 broken forest, it's not pure, but it's a good area. Uh, and, and the great thing about Doi Lang is that it's, um, it's got this road that goes up to, to the border post, but it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go beyond. So it's, so nobody uses it. No, no, almost no tour, tourists go up there. So, so it's a fantastic little, quite a narrow tarmac road, but you can stop anywhere and bird along it. And uh, it's a really great place for birding. And giant nuthatch is one of the specialities to look for. It's, um, it's the, the world's largest nuthatch. It's huge. Um, and it's a really lovely bird. And, uh, and yeah, we usually see that. It's a, it's a great bird to see. Maroon Oriole, this is a, I, I put this in because it's a, it's such a lovely bird. I love Maroon Orioles and I hadn't mentioned Orioles. Most, most Orioles are, are black and yellow, as you know, but, uh, uh, but we've got this maroon one. There's also a, a silver oriole, which is even, which is much rarer, which is only a winter visitor to Thailand, um, and which is quite similar to maroon. It's, but the, the maroon parts are replaced by white. Um, but maroon oriole occurs from the Himalayas down into Southeast Asia. Uh, it's a and it's a forest species of oriole. Um, another more, another philoscopus warbler, buff-throated warbler this time. Uh, winter visitor to Thailand um, and uh, um, it's sort of greenish yellow really. It's a, I, I, love, I love them but uh, quite distinctive. Uh, you need to know their calls really to, to nail these things. Um, this one is um, uh, like, they, most of them have fairly distinctive calls and certainly songs but, uh, but in winter time as this one would be, it would be just calling. Uh, breeds up in the higher parts of the Himalayas above the tree line. Chestnut vented nuthatch. It's a, this is a, a resident bird. It's, an, it's much smaller than the giant nuthatch, um, but it's only in Thailand. It's only found in the, this uh, northwest part. An ultramarine flycatcher, another another one of the special wintering flycatchers. Ultramarine. This is a, again a male. Fantastic little bird. And white gorgetted flycatcher um, keeps the lower levels um, and um, and often inside the forest. This is a really really shy bird, and um, it took me years to see one of these. But uh, but uh, if, um, if there are a few places now where you can actually find them fairly easily in Thailand, and I think they uh, they, they they look forward to our visit. So this is scarlet faced Leah Kickler. This is uh, also a, a member of the, um, it's, it's, it's a kind of laughing thrush really, um, spectacular looking bird and very, very shy, but uh, put a little bit of food out and uh, it will, it will, they will come in. You can see in the photo, you can actually see some, uh, some food that's been put out for it. So, uh, so it, it's, it does help and uh, photographers like to do that and, uh, and we um, enjoy watching the birds as well. So this is scarlet-faced Leah Kickler. Uh, and who doesn't like a ruby throat? This is a Siberian ruby throat. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's a first winter male. Uh, the full um, um, adult males have more, much redder and brighter throats and the females don't have any at all. So this will be a first winter male. And it's, um, they're, they're wonderful birds. They're winter visitors, of course, just uh, to Thailand. And then Mrs. Hume's pheasant. Well, what can I say? I mean, when I first went to Thailand, this was completely ungettable. No one knew where or how to see a Mrs. Hume's pheasant. Well, same, same with many of the other birds as well. But, but this was really, really difficult. But up on Doi Lang, 
it's a very quiet road and uh, it was discovered that every morning and every evening they cross this road to and fro from their feeding grounds to their roosting grounds and so if you just go and station yourself in the right place at the right time um, and wait uh, you may well see a Mrs Hume's pheasant crossing the road which is what we did and what we do and that's Mrs 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 Hume's pheasant so that's the female um, spectacular in her own way but not quite as bright as the male so Mrs Hume's pheasant and the other really uh, good game bird I hate using the word game birds um, uh, but uh, Fezianid that uh, you can see is a mountain bamboo partridge um, and these uh, can be quite easy to see on on uh, uh, on Doilang um, again with a bit of luck and patience uh, mountain bamboo partridge so leaving the highland areas a lot ahead the last place we could do up in the north is a, is a place called Taton Marsh and um, this used to be a, a marsh that had lots of tall elephant grass and was, was well known as a site for Jordan's bush chat and um, sadly most of the marsh is gone it, most of it's been drained and cultivated and um, and it's really hard you can still see we still go there and see some nice birds pied harriers like this male uh, can be quartering the area. You can see grey-headed lapwings in the stubble, uh, the rice stubble fields. You can find uh, rare warblers like um, um, uh, David's uh, uh, Baikal bush warbler, which is uh, Bradypterus davidi. Um, that can be seen there um, and, and all sorts of things. So it's, it's still worth going to. But um, Utai told me that when we when I was last there, he said that he hadn't seen, uh, hadn't seen any uh, Jordan's bush chats for about 10 years at Tatton. Um, and then we found this. So we found a pear, in fact, um, in, in, in tall, a, a, quite a smallish patch of tall elephant grass. So this is the male and there was a, a female there as well. In fact, I saw the female first before I saw the male. Um, so it's not a great photo, but it's a Jordan's bush chat and uh, it's quite a hard bird to see. Uh, it's a member of the stone chat family, but not, not an easy bird. So this is our bus that we travel around in. Uh, customized, customized bus, uh, got quite dirty and dusty uh, towards the end of the trip so Jiang, our driver there, uh, decided to uh, uh, customize it and, uh, and, and uh, put a put rock jumper on, uh, on the side. Uh, it's a very nice bus, it's got Wi-Fi and it's got uh, special seats that sort of massage you while you're driving along so uh, uh, Thailand tours are very comfortable these days. So just finishing up, going to the south, just show you a few species in the south so uh, this again is the map. So we fly to Krabi, we go to Kauno Chuchi, uh, which is famous for the site of Gurney's Pitta, as was. Uh, go to Pang Bay for things like uh, Bangrove Pitta and so on. Go to, to Sri Pang Na uh, up here for, for other forest birds like Banded Pitta and so on. And then Similan Islands as well, do a little day trip there. So spectacular scenery, uh, lots of big, big limestone plugs which have got forest on them and they're obviously completely inaccessible and then lots of mangroves around the uh, coast and in the creeks and so on uh, which are well worth looking at which means of course you get a few kingfishers so black cap kingfisher is actually quite a widespread species but a lovely looking kingfisher and collared kingfisher also uh, often in uh, especially in the mangroves Collared kingfisher, again, quite a widespread species. The ruddy kingfisher can be much harder to see. Um, it's shyer than the, the other two species, but uh, again, we usually see a few. And, uh, and this one is the brown wing kingfisher. Uh, this is a, more of a speciality. It, it, it only really occurs along the coastal mangrove areas of the um, uh, um, western, uh, eastern Indian Ocean, sorry. Um, so this is a good place to see brown wing kingfisher, not many other accessible places to see it. The coasts of Burma and Bangladesh uh, are not so easily gettable, I suppose, um, and it doesn't go much further south than Thailand. So brown wing kingfisher. Uh, Oriental pied hornbill, that's um, uh, a, quite a widespread species. We could have already seen that somewhere else on the tour. Uh, it's one of the smaller hornbills. Uh, I didn't mention green pigeons. There are a number of green pigeons. This one's little, um, but there are a number of species that we'll see on the tour in different places. Some of them in open habitat, some of them in forest. 
Um, I, I, I like green pigeons um, and uh, we'll try and see as many as we can. Uh, more sunbirds, this is brown-throated also, it's a quite, again it's fairly widespread sunbird, um, but we'll probably see more in the south than we would in further north. Different flower peckers here, this is orange-bellied, this is a, a species that goes down into Malaysia. It's a gorgeous looking flower pecker. black naked monarch, um, it's another flycatcher resident here at its nest, beautiful bird. Uh, again, a male, but black naked monarch is, it's a widespread species, but, uh, but it's uh, well always worth looking at. And then broadbills, well, a few more broadbills. We've already seen some, but we should, if there are any that we still need at the end of the tour, we'll mop them up uh, in, on the south. This is uh, black and yellow broadbill, um, showing how broad the bill is. Spectacular birds, I really like broadbills, but the best of all, what about this, green broadbill. Green broadbill. That has to be one of those. It is just so. It is just so iridescent and spectacular. It's 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 hard to. Books never illustrate them properly. Um, photographs do a bit better, uh, but it's such a bright green colour. Um, and they sit quietly for quite a long period of time. Uh, the trick is spotting them. But once you can, once you've spotted one, then, uh, then usually you can see it quite well. And pitters, of course, everyone wants to see pitters. One of the easier pitters to see, possibly, is mangrove pitter. Get yourself into some mangroves and, uh, and uh, you may well be in with a chance of seeing a mangrove pitter in this part of the world, at least. Um, and it's, there are four species of pitters that look a bit like this. There's, there's um, fairy uh, pitter, there's mangrove pitter, there's blue wing pitter. And... Um, what the other one is now. Uh, blue wing pitter also occurs in Thailand. Uh, fairy is only a vagrant. Blue wing, but it doesn't occur at the time of our tours usually uh, because it's not, it, it, it breeds in the rainy season and the rainy season is um, in, uh, in, in the what, well, the northern summer months. So sort of April, May time would be a better time to see uh, a blue wing pitter. But this is mangrove, which is resident and probably seeable throughout the year. And the Malayan banded pitter used to be just banded pitter, but it's been split into three species. And I think the Malayan is the best looking of the three. Um, there's a good, good sight uh, here to see that near Krabi. Uh, Malayan banded pitter, spectacular looking thing. And sadly, Gurney's pitter, which is out North Chi, uh, but is when I was last there. I, uh, they said there was one female left there only. Uh, they, they, it was never very common. Uh, they were re only rediscovered there about 20, 30 years ago in a fairly small patch of forest. Um, and the forest wasn't really big enough to sustain, sustain them for a long period of time. And the numbers have gradually dwindled. Uh, it is still found, I think, in Burma, in Myanmar, uh, across the border, and po possibly in decent numbers in parts of it. But it'll be threatened there too with, with logging. But um, it's largely gone from Thailand. It's certainly largely gone from Khao Noi Chu Chi, but, uh, but it, it, there may be one, one or two places where it might still exist in Thailand, but uh, I think it's being kept quite quiet. But Gurney's Pitta is, a, is a, a famous flagship species for Thailand. Uh, owls, uh, wood owl, brown wood owl is a, a species that we might encounter down there, or buffy fish owl, uh, a, a beautiful big, Owl. It's um, uh, that you can might find it at night if we walk around in near um, wetland areas, and a, a really good bird to find that is being seen a little bit more frequently than it used to be is Oriental bay owl. Um, it's it's a uh, it's in the Titonitae, but so it's related to barn owls. But uh, it's um, it's not an easy bird to see, uh, and I, I've spent quite a bit of time in Southeast Asia, and I've only seen a few myself. But uh, this is one of the places where you might luck into an oriental bay owl. And another night bird, of course, frogmouth, also with these great huge beaks. Um, uh, Gould's frogmouth is the, was one of the species that we might encounter down here with a bit of luck at night. So just finishing off in the Similan Islands, our day trip out to the Similan Islands. These are, are, are beautiful, a little series of beautiful islands off the coast. It takes an hour or two, so, an hour and a half or so to get out there in a, a speedboat. But the trouble is a lot of tourists like to go out there at the same time. Um, 
But there are several islands that we go to. They'll take you to one or two uh, islands on a, on a trip. And if you get away from the crowds a bit, you might find some special birds. Um, Pied imperial pigeon and white-bellied seagull are birds that you might find there. Uh, if you're really lucky, you might find a Malayan night heron uh, like this one, uh, which is a young bird, a uh, mature bird. Um, that's uh, that's uh, probably probably wintering there, I would guess, rather than uh, breeding. Um, but anyway, that's a possibility on the Similens. And that, but the real bird that people go there for is is this the Nicobar pigeon, spectacular looking pigeon. It's a very shy bird normally, and um, although it's quite widespread, um, it's a very hard bird to get to grips with. But here, they've become used to people, and it's actually easy to see them. And uh, it's one of the, it must be the best place to see Nicobar pigeon in the world, I would imagine. Because um, this this was taken just uh, just off the edge of the, of, of the restaurant where we were um, uh, having our lunch on the island. So and people all around really. So it's it's uh, it's not difficult, but it's a good bird to get. So that's it. Um, I want to thank um, my fellow leaders, especially Keith, Adam, and Marcus, for for many of the pictures. Although quite a few are mine as well. And the picture here I'm showing is yellow-breasted banting, which I just wanted to end on a slightly somber note. Um, this. Uh, breeds right across Eurasia uh, and sadly for it it likes to winter in big numbers so it, it winters in in, in, in in flocks in roosts in communal roosts in really really big numbers or it used to and it's been decimated by the Chinese trapping it to eat um, and it also they, it, they've done a lot of trapping in it in Thailand in the past as well. We we barely see it on our tours anymore. Um, it, it, I think it's sort of 30% chance of seeing it on the tours. Uh, we didn't see it on the last two tours I did there. Um, the first time I went to Thailand, I went to a lake in the middle there and they were coming into roost at night and I wrote down in my notebook, 100,000 plus. 100,000 plus I wrote in my notebook. It was impossible, the sky was black. They were just coming down to the reed beds and there were nets, big long nets in the reed beds. And there were so many birds in the nets, it was standing room only. You, there was no room for any more birds in the nets. They're absolutely full of yellow-breasted buntings. And the bird is now critically endangered. It's just so sad. But um, fortunately, many other birds are still easy to see. And I will preempt a question that someone will ask me about what birds to get, what books to get. So I will preempt the question um, and the top left there, Bird Guide of Thailand, that's actually the second edition. That used, the first edition was in 68, the second edition was in 74. It was illustrated by Boonsong Lekogul. Boonsong was a con prominent conservationist in Thailand and he did an awful lot to help protect birds and he was brilliant. And I actually met him on my first visit and he showed me around a bit. And uh, he wrote and illustrated this book, and he also did one on um, butterflies as well. And then it became Boonsong and Phil Round got together, and they, they had a different artist did that one. And that, I don't know if that's still available, probably not still available in English, uh, but it was an excellent book, this one here, um, and with, with, with new illustrations. This is the uh, Thai version of this one. Um, it's, there's been three Thai versions since, but not another English one. So using the same illustrations as that one, um, and that's only available in Thai. Then there's the Craig Robson one, which is a cut down from his Southeast Asia guide. Um, sure, may, might still be available. I should have found out. I don't know. It might still be available. Still extremely good. And then this is the latest one, which is from Lynx Editions, um, and that's probably the one that most people will use. It's, it's very, very good. Uh, it's frustrating on the taxonomy uh, and, the, and the layout, but uh, but that's um, they just lay it all out, and um, and so you have got similar species on different pages, and uh, so they make no concessions. And the wren babblers are now in di three different families, so they're they're spread throughout three different places in the book when they all look very similar, which I think is really annoying. But um, so there's no concessions to, to being user friendly. It's just done taxonomically, but it's a great book. And, uh, that it, and it's written by Utai who leads our tours. So, so you have to have that one really. So that's, that's, that's it on books. The, the only other thing I didn't tell you about was when to go. People always ask when to go. 
Um, it's the hot season is Mar March to June, the rainy season, July to October, and the cool season is November to February. But most people tend to go in, in our win northern winter months, December, February, because that's when the northern winter migrants are there. But if you want to see breeding birds, uh, you might need to go a little bit later in the rainy season. Um, and some birds, as I mentioned before, like blue wings and hooded pitters, you can uh, really only see in the rainy season. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, Nigel. You just you just broke up there for a second. Okay. Because that stopped. <laughs> ah. <laughs> that, that, would that would explain it. <laughs> um, yeah, excellent, Nigel. Wow, the, the I mean your yellow the whole presentation was amazing. Your yellow breasted bunting image at the at the last was was staggering. I mean, your account of, of that many birds and yeah. Um, look, I mean, I know, geez, from, from all my visits to, to Thailand, I've, I've, ne I've yet to see the bird in Thailand. Yeah. I mean, really that, that, photo, crazy. that photo I took in Siberia in the 80s, that photo, oh. and they were so common in Siberia in the 80s, we didn't even bother to sort of count them and put, put a number down for the day, you know, because they were just a sort of bird, like sparrows, you know, just to see them all the time. They were just singing oh, everywhere. Extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary, yeah. Mm. Amazing, as you say, now critically endangered bird, very, very. Yeah, well, they, 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 the bird life website actually says it's a. It could could this be the next passenger pigeon? You know, a bird that went from being so common to yeah. to becoming extinct. Extraordinary, extraordinary. But as you say, um, yeah. yeah. Look, fantastic presentation, Nigel. That was a wonderful trip down memory lane for me. I mean, it's uh, been a couple of years since I was last there, but uh, mm. yeah, uh, amazing country, very close to my heart, and, and I can see very close to yours as well. And mm. and I think uh, there's just so many mouthwatering species. There's so many uh, so many amazing birds to to go out and search for as well. Mm. Uh, so thank you so much for that, for sharing your knowledge as well. I think everyone really enjoyed it. Um, and then just quickly before we dive into to Q&A uh, with yourself and Nikki, and there's a few questions that have come through, uh, we're going to head back in a couple of weeks time, we're going to go through to North America, back switching continents as usual, um, and it's going to be Arizona that's going to be showcased, um, and that's going to be Stefan Lorenz showcasing that one, speaking about Arizona, um, he's actually done a couple of trips there recently, um, when we've gone through, um, through recently, what, August, September, um, doing a few trips down there but yeah it's, it's look it's one of the united states most uh popular regions for birding um hosts loads of specials of birds like montezuma quail and elegant trogons and olive warblers and vendai's thrasher there's, there's so many so many specials a lot of quality around um and arizona also happens to be the hummingbird capital of the united states so it's uh yeah fantastic fantastic birding uh dry country birding of note and uh, yeah, it's going to be a, a wonderful exploration with Stefan there in, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, also, just a reminder again that you can always watch our webinars. Uh, again, they're recorded up on the site. Um, you can always link through and watch, watch ones that have gone by. I know many of you do, uh, but just a reminder that they are up there for your enjoyment and viewing pleasure. And then just finally, um, I know we've been mentioning since these webinars started really um, during the the, the onset of the pandemic, um, you know, that we've been offering these webinars free of charge and that we've had a GoFundMe link open as well um, with those proceeds going towards our guides. Um, but just, yeah, to let you know, look, you know, tours are back up, they are running. Um, and Nikki and I would both like to thank all of you uh, for your support of, of all of our tour leaders. Uh, but we are going to be closing that GoFundMe um, at the end of this webinar so this will be a last opportunity if you want to make any donations to that you can still do so uh, but we will be closing that uh, very soon so yeah thank you for all your support and over to Nikki and Nigel. Oh. Uh, thanks Keith uh, I echo that thank you everyone for supporting the guides uh, over the last uh, few months so it's really really appreciate appreciated and um, Nigel, oh, the luminous color of that green broad bell, bell is just beautiful. I think for me, that was my favorite bird. At, I would love to see that. Um, that's the one I have not seen. So mm -hmm. amazing. So some of the questions we've got here is, um, uh, they're going to add a question. Are there uh, any breeding or conservation programs for the spoon billed sandpiper? seeing their dwindling numbers. Oh, 
yes <laughs> they've been they've been working on it for years um absolutely they're they're, uh, they're, they're absolutely on it um i, I mean oh, thailand they, they've now bought this little reserve to help protect them in winter there which is great but there's a lot of ongoing work um to survey them uh, in their breeding grounds which is in the chukotka peninsula in northeastern siberia so uh, there's been a lot of work going on. There's also doing work on finding their wintering sites in, in Myanmar and in Bangladesh. So yes, there is. And on top of that, there is also a captive breeding program going on in England. Um, they, they've been bringing eggs, from, flying eggs out from, from Thailand, and they've been taking them to Slimbridge in England and where they've been hatching them. And they've finally, after years of trying, they've actually had some success and they've actually hatched some now. And, uh, and, and, and yeah, I think some have even uh, have managed to fledge. To, uh, so, so that program is doing, doing quite well. So, so yes, there's a lot of work being done for, to, to try to save that bird. Oh, that is amazing. Um, yeah. um, Following that question, someone's asking about poaching, whether there's a problem with the wild bird trade in Thailand. Yes, um, there is. Uh, there is some. It's not as bad as uh, it's not as bad as some places, uh, but uh, but there is some some poaching goes on, certainly. Um, but uh, uh, but but generally the Thais uh, are, are quite uh, protective of their wildlife. There's a good system of national parks. Um, uh, it, it's it's a, a large number of parks, and the Thais like going and using the parks. So um, so so generally, it's uh, it, it's 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 fairly positive. Um, a, a, almost a bigger threat these days are photographers. There's so many people are interested in photographing the birds, and uh, you 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 go out and uh, you see these Thai photographers without binoculars, just with cameras and playing. Uh, bird sounds, tape recorders with huge speakers playing these things oh. constantly to try to attract them, and and of course the birds just just get used to it and uh, and ignore it or or go away, and uh, it's uh, very frustrating. But um, oh. but yeah, they do poach. Uh, they catch birds also, small birds. They catch so they can release them at, uh, at temples sometimes. Um, um, so to um, they think it's a uh, it, it's good brings them good luck to to release these birds at temples so what the birds that were being trapped all those yellow-breasted buntings i saw being trapped uh, all those years ago what they were being caught for i i assume for temples rather than food china they eat them mm. um i i don't think in thailand they were doing that for eating so much but but I, i'm not really sure um okay. mm. Um, what is the highest, uh, Harriet's asking, what is the highest ever uh, height that one would travel uh, on the tour? Um, well, we go, we go up to the top of Doi Intanon, which is 2,500 meters, but we drive. You don't have to walk. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that, that is the highest we go. Uh, but yeah, we drive all the way to the top. Yeah, well, that's yeah. good to hear. I don't think I'd make it walking up. <laughs> and there's no, 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 and there's no hiking around at the top. You just sort of potter around very slowly. So, what, so. what sort of fitness level do you think someone would need uh, for the type of tours that we're running in Thailand? Uh, uh, absolutely average fitness level. Um, there, there's no big hikes really. Uh, it's all very gentle. Um, you, you drive up roadsides. You get out. You walk a little bit. Get back in the van. Drive on a bit more. Um, uh, there are some forest trails that you go on um, uh, uh, and a few paddies you walk around but no it's uh, it's 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 easy it's gentle oh great um peter is actually asking uh can you share what kind of camera and lens you use to take such beautiful and wonderful pictures well, well they're not all my pictures for a start um <laughs> But um, uh, but but what I use is a Canon D uh, uh, um, 7D plus the 100 to 400 millimeter lens, which is a very very popular um, combination used by by birders. Um, so it's it's a bit heavy, but it's very good. Um, I, I I mean I got it right here if you wanted to see it, but uh, <laughs> but it's um it's a 
seven D Canon seven D with a one hundred to four hundred millimeter lens, but a lot of people now are going mirrorless, and the Canon have got a new one called an R five, um, which is quite expensive, but it's astonishing. It's even it's way better, and I can see I can see people moving over to that. One or two of my friends already have, uh, and you can still use it with the same lens that I've got, um, which which is good. But it, but it's a, it's quite expensive uh, option. But uh, the body itself is quite expensive. I mean, I mean like I think about sort of three or four thousand pounds. I think just for the body. Um, oh. But mirrorless is is seems to be the way to go. Is is that the same for you, Keith? What what camera equipment do you use? Yeah, yeah, pretty much use the same setup as as Nigel. Uh, very very similar setup. Uh, with that, with that Canon lens, um, and I know some of the other guys. And I know Marcus is shooting with a with a 500, a Canon 500 at the at the end, but just before he left us. So a lot of those photos were taken with his with his uh, 500. Uh, do, you, do you know if any other, anyone's using mirrorless yet? Uh, no, no, I, I don't think any of. I mean, I stand corrected because you know I haven't connected well. I mean, we've connected with the guys a lot, but I haven't I haven't seen yeah. any of him for about a year and a half. No. Well, a couple of friends but, um, and, and discussed equipment really, but I don't know if any of them have actually gone and purchased yeah something mirrorless. But well, I haven't, I haven't heard, I haven't heard during discussions. Yeah, so I think a lot of them are still uh, using their, their gear from a few years ago. A couple of friends of mine have got mirrorless, and the hmm. and it's particularly good on birds in flight because the autofocus uh, just just homes in on the eye yeah. so so well that you get these fantastic pictures of birds in flight. Yeah. Wow. Well, I was recently in, you know, in, in Costa Rica and one of the guys on the trip there was, was shooting with a mirrorless and, and okay. fantastic, fantastic results. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was looking, looking great. Yeah. Um, Nigel, is there any compulsory injections or tablets that's required when going to Thailand? No, not really. Um, obviously, um, you, you should consult uh, medical uh, help uh, a doctor or something but uh, but no there's uh, the usual things really um it's always um i mean i'm always fully protected against things like hepatitis and so on um as far as malaria is concerned a, a lot of people do take the tablets there but to be honest you don't really need it for thailand most of thailand's fine um they only really recommend malaria Ta uh, for tablets uh, in Thailand for if you go to areas right on the Burmese border or um, uh, in the forest, not, uh, not in the north, in the, in the west. Uh, and we don't really do that. So, so I, I would say it's not, I, I don't usually bother taking them these days when I go to Thailand. Um, oh. So it's not much in the way of malaria and everything else, just, just the usual really. Um, and then Ricky's saying, any programs to protect the yellow-breasted bunting? Uh, they're not sure um, if that's the right word um, or of the bird, but now uh, oh. that it's endangered. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, th they certainly know what's... Uh, ..in big trouble. Um, and I, I'm sure BirdLife is trying to do something about it. Uh, but the problem is, is this widespread um, trapping that goes on in, in, in southern China, which is uh, one of the places where they winter. Um, I'm not sure about Thailand. The numbers are probably not big enough in Thailand for them to even bother anymore. Yeah. Um, but in, in China, they are. Um, I reckon I was served up yellow-breasted buntings once in China. I went, I, I was, I went to a restaurant where they, um, uh, it was a, bank, well, the, a so-called banquet, and there was a big bowl of of little nuggets of little nuggets of meat um and i'm sure they were small small songbirds um huh. which they which they would have probably called sparrows and i bet they were yellow breasted buntings huh. but um, i don't know i'm sure they're trying to do something it's more a question of education really um uh the birds range is contracting we used to see it on our finland tours in, in days gone past but they've disappeared from there that's the far west of their range it was always an outpost but there used to be a few pairs breeding in Finland um, until about 15 years ago and they've gone from there. Um, yeah, I'm going to end off with the very last question here from David. Um, David is saying fantastic presentation Nigel, enjoyed every minute of it especially your enthusiasm and your knowledge and I, I second that. 
Any Thank comments you. on the, the major raptor migration site down in the south of Thailand? Worth visiting at the right time? Yes, absolutely. I didn't mention those, but that's quite true. Yeah, uh, yeah. migration is, a, is another good time to go. Um, yes, I, I should have really said that if you wanted to see migration, then um, uh, you go to a, a yet again a different time of year. So uh, there are several good sites in the south, in the peninsula, where you can go and see mi raptor migration, yeah. Um, and they get quite a good variety of species and quite good numbers. Uh, you want to go, probably want to go in October uh, for that. Um, and, and similarly, if you wanted spring migration, you can go and see spring migrants, not, not just raptors, but other things, uh, passerines as well. Uh, in Southeast Thailand, you could go in April and see them. Um, so that's, those are different things to do at different times of year. Uh, we do tours mainly at uh, November, December time, and also in, also in the late winter, I think, in, in February, yeah. March. And that's because the northern migrants are there, but you, you would have to go different time of year to see raptor migration. But yeah, sure, it's, 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 it would be worth doing. I've not done it myself yet, actually. Sounds like a, a, a great uh, tour for our TaylorMade department um, yes. that we could set up. So if you're keen, yes. definitely email us and we'll put something together for you. Mm. And, and that concludes all the Q&A. So very much thank you so much, um, Nigel. Um, and anything, yeah, uh, from, from all of us from the Rock Jumper team, um, just to say thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, everyone. Go well. Bye. Uh, Thanks. Bye.